Mother's Day truly represents to us and symbolizes the power of a mother's influence upon our lives, whether it be from the blessings of a good mother, the negative impact of a bad mother, or the sorrowful reminder of a mother who is no longer with us. Regardless of the company you find yourself in right now, Mother's Day is a day that moves everybody. For some of you in here, Mother's Day is one of the most rewarding and joy-filled days of the year. And for others, Mother's Day is one of the darkest, most depressing days of the year. And as many of you already know, this was certainly the case for my wife Lindsay and I for over a decade. Being told by the doctors in October of 2001 that we would never be able to have our own children, and then 10 years later, finally seeing the fruition of a ton of prayers come true and be granted, and now we're blessed with Jeremiah. But yet, Lindsay and I know all too well about the painful sting that Mother's Day can have upon a family and especially upon a hurting wife. It can be a very dark and hopeless place to be at times. And yet, when we think about the pain that some of us are forced to deal with and the emotional scars that such pain leaves, we're also reminded that there's always someone else whose pain is far deeper and has even experienced more suffering than us. And one incredible lady I know that had to endure far more pain in life than anyone else I've ever met. Let me just tell you, imagine being raised in a family and you have three little brothers. And then at age 12, your mother suddenly dies from a brain aneurysm. Forcing you to not only deal with the reality that you're going to grow up without your loving mother, but now you've been forced into a place where you are now the surrogate mother of your three younger brothers. That is what young Evelyn Turner had to deal with at the age of 12 when her mother died at age 34. When her father remarried shortly after this, sweet little Evelyn found herself walking in the shoes of Cinderella as she had a stepsister and a new stepmother who really treated her as an unloved orphan throughout her life. She was blamed for every little bit of trouble that her devious little stepsister could create. She was also forced to stay home from school and skip getting an education so that she could take care of all of the housework while her stepsister was encouraged on in her education. And if the pain of losing her loving mom at such a young age and being treated as an unloved orphan was not bad enough, when she became an adult, it even got worse. When Evelyn got married to William Wynn, they ended up having three children, Billy, Bobby, and Linda. Prior to Linda being born, Evelyn's middle child, Bobby, died at 18 months of age due to whooping cough and pneumonia. And so Evelyn once again was devastated as her little boy was taken at such a young age. A short time after that, at the age of five, her, her oldest son, Billy, had appendicitis. And as the doctor was doing surgery on him, he started to come out of um, his sleep. And so the doctor gave him more ether, which is what they used back then to um, cause the sleep. And so when he gave him more ether, it caused little Billy to overdose and die right there on the table at age five. Within the blink of an eye, Evelyn had lost both of her baby boys. And if this wasn't enough to crush the spirits of this young mother, upon returning from World War II, Evelyn's husband who was now working at a shipyard, ended up getting in a horrible accident when a crane dropped a very heavy steel beam on him and crushed him and killed him at age 32. Leaving Evel Evelyn alone as a widow and her little baby girl, Linda Marie, without a father. You talk about a person who had every reason to have her heart turn bitter towards others to have her heart turn bitter towards life and to have her heart turn bitter towards God, it was certainly her. She had every, every right to take Job's wife's advice 
and to curse God and die because of all of the great loss that she had been through. And yet, this was not the road this amazing individual chose to take. And I want you to know that my grandmother, Evelyn, lived her entire life as one of the nicest, kindest, most loving people I've ever known. She lived a blessed life, a full life. She loved everyone, and I don't know how she did it. Growing up, I remember she'd tell me stories about her life. And I, I couldn't comprehend how she could still trust in God through all of the loss that she went through. And yet, I'll never forget, even as a little boy, she'd just say, Jay, I just always knew God was with me. And that was a story that my mom, Linda, and I heard throughout our entire lives, is God is always with me, and I know that God loves me. My grandmother was truly a, a hero of the faith to me. And her relationship with God has greatly impacted my life and, and, and the way that I can look to God and, and trust in his faithfulness as well. I've never shared this story with anyone before, actually. First time I actually put it down on paper was this week because I just felt like the Lord had a message for all of us through the life of my grandmother. And it's what's inspired the title of this morning's message, When a Mother Walks with Jesus. This morning, we're going to discover the importance of a mother who walks by faith in Jesus, as well as the influence that she has upon her home. She purposely invests in the lives of her kids. And so would you please stand with me in honor of reading God's word? We are going to be in Matthew chapter 15 this morning. If you don't have your Bible with you, we do have the verses on the screen. We're going to be looking at verses 21 through 28 right now. The Bible says in verse 21, Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Verse 22 says, And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Thank you for standing. You guys may be seated now. So here we read about a mother who, whose little girl was severely suffering due to the fact that she was demon-possessed. And we see that this woman does something incredibly radical. She's a Gentile. And in faith, she goes to the Jewish Messiah for help. And when she gets there, the encounter that she has with Jesus would test her faith to the limits. In fact, as we look at this event more closely, we're going to see that there were several obstacles that stood between her and her daughter's recovery. In fact, that's what has inspired our first life application of this morning. If you're filling out notes in your handouts, um, the first life application this, in this morning's message is that when a mother walks with Jesus, her faith will be challenged. When a mother walks with Jesus, her faith will be challenged. In this passage of Scripture, we are going to to discover that in her attempts to pursue Jesus, her faith was seriously challenged in four different ways. The first way that this mom's faith was challenged is in verse 22, where we read that she came to Jesus saying, have mercy on me, for my daughter is demon-possessed. This poor mom's faith was tested to the limits due to the fact that her little girl was severely demon-possessed. In fact, looking on the screen, this mother's First challenge was the fact that her daughter was demon-possessed. That uh, that's the first challenge she faced. The Bible tells us in John 10.10 10, that the devil has come to kill, the devil has come to steal, and the devil has come to destroy. And right here we see this as a prime ex example of the devil accomplishing his mission. This poor mother and her poor daughter and their entire family must have had so much emotional and personal and family stress 
upon their lives due to the fact that their little girl was demon-possessed. Children are already difficult enough to raise when they are in their right mind. Can I get an amen? <laughs> amen. But to have a child be demon-possessed, it, it takes it to a whole other level. Do you know what I mean? But chances are none of us will ever have to deal with a demon-possessed child. But there are plenty of us that can relate to a different type of possession, and that is toddler possession. In fact, looking on the screen, two weeks ago, my, my family went to Legoland with the Sprangers. And we soon realized that when Henry and Jeremiah are together, if they ever put their efforts together for Jesus, they are going to turn this world upside down. We also figured out that when Henry and Jeremiah put their efforts together without Jesus, they still have the ability to turn this entire world upside down. Those two ended up going wacko there. It was as if they had mad toddler disease. I kid you not, we arrived at Legoland that, that looking like two sets of shiny, happy, blessed Christian families, and, and we left there looking like exhausted, run down, trampled over, beaten up and defeated Christians. I wanted to take that smile, Jesus loves you sticker, right off my car. <laughs> but looking on the screen right there at that little train ride, wow, it was all fun and games as Cam and I were standing outside the gate as Jeremiah and Henry were riding around that circle on that little train. It was all it was all fun and fine and wonderful until that train stopped and I was the one that walked into the gate uh, to get Henry and Jeremiah out of that train. The moment I got Henry and Jeremiah out of that train, I was standing here, Henry and Jeremiah are walking that way toward the exit and, and wouldn't you know that there was an empty conductor's booth and as they're walking, all of a sudden little Henry catches the eye that that room is empty. He just walks over and he goes and hits this big red button that says only press in case of emergency. I kid you not, that little stunt shut down that entire ride for over an hour. I am laughing my head off, and Cam is just going like this. And I'm like, no, Cam, we're going to have this story forever. It's awesome. And so he lightened up a little bit, but we're laughing. And I kid you not, ten minutes later, you see the, the young lady that was working there. She's just walking past, and she is fuming because she cannot get this ride to start up again. Closed it down for over an hour before she could get somebody to come and turn it back on. It was hilarious. I, I mean, <laughs> it wasn't hilarious. <laughs> Later that day, Jeremiah thought it would be great to do a, a him at cow tipping version, and so he decided to take a big dumpster and knock it over. And I have to tell you, when you're the parent of a child that dumps over a trash that is full of wet and soggy garbage, and it's not your garbage, it is a very gross experience. Looking on the screen there, it, it, you're going to see the next slide shows Henry and Jeremiah at the Sea Life Aquarium. It's a fun photo, right? Nice and blue. Well, the, the, the story that this photo doesn't share is that as Henry and Jeremiah are hogging that little cliff area for so long, do you see where Henry's standing? Well, there's a wave that comes over. I kid you not, I was standing right there, and this 10-year-old boy, three times Henry's size, walks up, and Henry stops him dead in his tracks. I kid you not, and he's going like this. And I'm just standing back watching Henry, watching this big kid, and he wasn't budging. That big kid, three times Henry's size, just gets around, turns around, and walks away with his parents. Again, I was just laughing so hard. <laughs> I mean, inside, of course. Bad Henry, bad Henry. <laughs> but looking at this next picture, by the end of the day, Legoland security got fed up with Henry and Jeremiah and put him behind bars. And we've been banned from Legoland for the rest of our lives. <laughs> but whether, whether your family is suffering from demon possession or toddler possession, there are many potential challenges that can keep you from Jesus, or in our case, quickly draw you to him. Uh, but just as this lady in this story from Matthew 15 did not allow her circumstances in life to keep her from pursuing Jesus, we can find great encouragement for ourselves, that when we're facing obstacles in our life, this lady's going to give us a great example of how to pursue after the Lord. The second way, so the first way that she had a challenge is just that her kid was messed up. 
The second way that this mom's faith was challenged, and if you're writing on your handouts in verse 23, is the fact that Jesus doesn't answer her. We read in verse 23 that this desperate mom came to Jesus pleading for him to help her. And the Bible tells us that she cried out to Jesus for help. And yet, even though she's in this desperate place, she's crying out for the Lord. The Bible tells us that Jesus did not answer her. The Bible says that he answered her not a word. And yet, with this woman, we see someone who's demonstrating enormous faith because she doesn't allow Jesus, who is remaining silent, to keep her from pursuing him. The third way this mom's faith was challenged is in verse 23 also, which is the fact that oftentimes there will be others who will try to discourage you as well. In verse 23 we read, but he, speaking of Jesus, answered her not a word. He didn't even answer her. How many times is, have we sought the Lord desperately in our lives and we feel like, God, why won't you answer? Why won't you move on my behalf? Well, here's a classic case of this happening in real time. He doesn't speak a word to her. But if that isn't bad enough, the Bible says that then his disciples came and urged him, saying, send her away, Lord, she's bugging us. And I'm telling you, there's going to be times in your life where even, we even well-meaning believers are going to tell you to give up on Jesus. They're going to tell you, he, he's not here right now for you in that matter. You need to get over it. You just need to grow up and get over it. You've been grieving over that long enough. You've been praying for that blessing long enough. Just get over it. That's basically what's happening here. Make no mistake about it, moms. Make no mistake about it, dads. Make no mistake about it, church. Your faith is regularly going to be tested as you walk with Jesus on this earth. And that is what's taking place in this lady's life. But this lady's a shining example to us of what it means to continue persevering. In fact, after these first three things, one, just the fact that her home life is messed up. She's got a demon-possessed child. I'm sorry, there is no shiny, happy, smiling, peaceful home going on when you have a child that is demon-possessed. Her entire life is chaos. She comes to Jesus praying and he doesn't answer her a word. Then his disciples, you know, 11 of those 12 are the ones that Jesus used to change the world. They're why we're here today. And they're saying, Lord, get rid of her. And now we see a fourth one. Not, Jesus finally speaks up. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you. Now I can hear your voice. And, and what does he say? No. The fourth way this mom's faith was challenged is found in verse 24, and that is the fact that when Jesus finally does respond to her, he says, no, I'm not going to help you. In verse 24, Jesus responds to her looking on the screen. He says, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The reason Jesus says this to her is not because he's not willing to help her, but it's to make clear that the Messiah was sent to first offer salvation to the Jews in order to keep the promises made through King David in the Old Testament. Therefore, it would be inappropriate for Jesus to first bring blessings to the Gentiles before the Jews had the opportunity to receive their blessings from him. Much like the firstborn son in a, in a family is offered the greater inheritance, as well as the, the first one offered the family business, so too were the Jews in Jesus' day, the first ones that were offered salvation through Messiah. This causes... This woman to fall at Jesus' feet. He says, no, I, I wasn't sent to the Gentiles, but first the Jews. It causes, causes her to cry out in verse 25 to say, Lord, help me. Help me. And how many times have we found ourselves in that situation where you're just begging for the Lord to help you? And then you either don't hear a word. Actually, you're, doing, you're going through all of it. You're not hearing him. Where are you, God. Like the Lamentations say, it feels like there's a, a big cloud between you and heaven, and it, it's absorbing all the prayers so that it doesn't get to God. And not only that, then you, you don't hear Jesus, and you're stuck in your situation, but, but then you've got other believers all of a sudden thinking that they can fix you by telling you to stop worrying, stop grieving, 
try this. They'll, they'll, in well-meaning ways, they'll have you do, I tell you, for 10 long years, you would not know how many people were so uncomfortable with the fact that Lindsay and I could not have children that they say, have you thought about adoption? No, I've never heard of adoption before. What's adoption? Now, I know that all of us have probably tried to encourage others before and we just have foot and mouth disease because it comes from a heart of wanting to help and heal. But we can really take uh, a good lesson from Job's friends. They were most effective when they didn't say a word. Amen? Amen. Yes, I want a big amen from the whole church. Have that ministry of presence. You don't need to speak a word except I'm here for you. I love you. And if there's anything I can do for you, let me know. But I'm not letting you walk alone. I'm walking with you through this. And yet this woman had none of that right now. And so in Matthew 25 and 26, after Jesus says, no, this is what happens. She then says, and you can look on the screen. I have the verses. She then says, Lord, help me. And then in verse 26, he answered her and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. This response from Jesus had the power to crush her faith permanently, and yet it didn't. And the reason Jesus says uh, she's a little dog, he's not using the same term that the Pharisees would have used for Gentiles that that would have described a scavenger going through the street and eating and picking through the garbage. He's, he's describing her as a little house pet. And so it wasn't this offensive word that he was used, even though it was a word to say, you're not getting anywhere with me right now. Because the children, referring to the children of Israel, are the ones that are going to get fed. But rather than being offended, this woman clued into what Jesus said and added to his analogy of pets under a family dining table by saying in verse 27, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. So she's saying even the little pets in the house, they get fed, Lord. And this woman shows a heart of humility here by saying, God, I'm willing to be whatever you want me to be. If you say I'm a little dog, I'm a little dog. And can you say that this morning? Can you look Jesus in the eyes and say, Lord, I'm willing to be whatever you want me to be. Lord, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. Lord, I'm willing to go wherever you want me to go because this is the place that that mother was at in life. She was at a place where, Jesus, whatever you want me to be, I'm going to be. And wherever you want me to go, I'm going to go. And whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do. It's been rightly said, looking on the screen, that Jesus responded to this desperate mother as he did, not to destroy her faith, but to develop it. And this mother clearly understood this and did not hesitate before the apparent obstacle that was before her. She brilliantly turned it to her advantage when he said, when he mentioned that she was like a little dog. And she said, yeah, Lord, but even little dogs, they, get, they feed off the crumbs that fall. And that is when, in that humble response, that Jesus could no longer keep his intended purpose away from her. In, in Matthew 5, 28, that Jesus answered and said to her, oh, woman, oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. Jesus knew all along what he had intended to do for this woman. But in the process, he has taught this loving mom and all who have heard about her story how God feels about persistent faith that refuses to give up. We see that Jesus acknowledges her of having great faith. She's the only, she's the only person in all of Scripture where Jesus said, great is your faith. He said it also to a Gentile centurion. He said, I haven't seen faith so great like this in all of Israel. And here now with another Gentile woman, he says, woman, you've got great faith. And so, guys, in the first part of this morning's message, we have discovered that, that the way we live out our faith for Jesus not only impacts our life, 
but for mothers and fathers especially, and even for us as brothers and sisters in the Lord who come aside others. The way we live out our, our faith in Jesus not only imp- impacts our life, but it also impacts the most important people around us, especially our children. And it influence, influences our children in following Jesus. For this lady, her faith moved Jesus in such a way that her daughter was healed. And so the first part of this message, we've looked at the aspect of our faith, that we've got to be men and women who walk by faith and unyielding faith in Jesus.